This is Xi Ting welcoming you to Backstage, the life behind the music. This is an online series of conversations with pianists, an exploration of their remarkable artistic lives as performers, teachers, and advocates for music. Through talking, I hope to shed some light on their process, to get a glimpse into some of their music making, the real work that takes place before they or their students step out onto the stage. Great to see you again, Dr. Gustafson, and I am so happy to be able to uh, do this interview with you. And I just saw you and worked with you at the Palmetto Festival, which was a great experience. We worked with so many wonderful students and so many great faculty and guest artists gave recitals. I was just wondering, what are your favorite part of the festival? Um, <laughs> there are so many wonderful highlights from this year. I think. One of the best parts was to be able to actually have the festival in person. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, it's been so difficult to have those real life experiences. And you know, virtual teaching is great, but it has its limits. So being able to actually be there in the same room with all of the students and feel their energy was pretty amazing. Yes, definitely. And then I love that the students all got um, to perform at the final concert, and then that's a great experience for them too, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, having the ability to have live performances was wonderful and really quite emotional for me because those were the first live performances that I had attended since the pandemic began. Yeah, that's a big step, and then it's like we're looking at a little bit of light at the end, at the end of a dark tunnel. And、um, I heard some of your great students at the festival, and you seem to be very successful at、um, that age group, pre-college students. I was wondering what is your secret, and what is your teaching philosophy for,、um, I mean, all all、uh, all students of all ages. Um, yeah, I I guess I would say I have a special draw towards that age group, towards the pre-college age group.、Um, I think because I grew up actually in the south of this country, pretty much from the age of eight up until the eight when I started piano up until the age of fifteen. So、um, while there are a lot of great piano teachers in the south, I didn't have access to those teachers. And I just felt like I had big gaps in my training. So when I was doing my undergrad at Manhattan School of Music,、um, that passion for that age group, teaching that age group, kind of started to develop. And I thought, you know, if I could be that teacher, if I could be that mentor that they need,、um, I would be giving them something that I didn't really have.、Um, but you know, my I don't really have a specific teaching philosophy per se,、um, other than I think you need to have a passion. For the instrument first, of course,、um, and a really, really high standard, but with a lot of grace. So that's how I teach. When I hear someone play, I try not to focus on everything that they're doing wrong. Although, of course, as piano teachers, that's kind of like an obvious thing that comes to our ears.、Um, but instead, I try to see the potential, and so I try to work with them. And while I'm Um, helping them improve on their weaknesses, I try to really motivate them, encourage them on their strengths, and I think that, you know, precisely for that age group, they're so impressionable that they need a lot of positive reinforcement. Yeah, definitely. And if you have a successful、um, student, you must feel very rewarding to be able to see them. Um, grow up and become an accomplished、uh, artist themselves. Yeah, that's so important to me to to be able to be there, almost like a a musical mom, <laughs> and and watch their development. But I have to say that even if they decide to go into another field,、um, which has of course happened to all of us, right? We have brilliant students that decide to go to Harvard and do something else <laughs>、um, or major in another field.、Um, Just being able to be a part of their lives and impact them at that age is such a privilege and such an honor. Yes. On top of being、um, a very active teacher, you also perform a lot. And I remember、uh, asking you, "How do you do it? How do you balance organizing two big festivals and then practicing and teaching a lot?、Um, what is your、um, daily schedule like? How do you balance everything?" 
Uh, well, it's funny that you mention it because I've been really thinking a lot about that lately. Um, of course, managing the festivals and practicing and teaching is a lot. But on top of that, I'm a mom of two small kids. <laughs> so I think that's kind of what puts it over the edge of um, sanity and into the realm of chaos <laughs> and insanity. Um, but so I, I have been thinking a lot about scheduling and um, just habits and how we create our daily habits. And I think that the thing that has been coming back to me um, over and over a few things, but two of the main things that have been coming back to me, the first one is we try for progress, not for perfection. So if we miss a habit, you know, one day or we miss a scheduled something that's scheduled in our day and we don't quite make it because life happens, um, instead of just kind of being an all or nothing type of person, which I used to be, <laughs> um, I try to be happy with the nooks and crannies of my day. So if I don't have a three hour block to practice, that's okay because an hour and 45 minutes here and then half an hour after the kids go to bed and then, you know, maybe 20 minutes right before I go to bed, that's better than just saying, oh, I don't have three hours of uninterrupted practicing, so I'm not going to do it. And even if it is only an hour and 45 minutes, it's better than zero minutes, right? So mm -hmm. that's something that I've been really thinking about. Um, and then the other thing that I've been thinking about partially with the pandemic and also just learning myself how to balance everything um, is that daily consistency for the simple reason of being the best that you can be is so important. It's not because we need to practice for a concert. It's not because we need to practice for a recording. Even if everything is canceled because of COVID for another year, we still have to show up. And the reason for that is because we are pianists and we're dedicated to the music and we should love the music and love ourselves enough to show up for ourselves every day. Yeah, that, I think that's very important, uh, especially for students who are just out of school like myself, uh, just graduated, newly graduate students to be able to kind of manage um, your life on your own and kind of plan everything ahead. But I think you're a great model for me to learn from. And um, speaking of career, you are a Yamaha artist. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, your association with the Yamaha uh, label and um, your experience? Yeah, um, I was invited to a trip. I guess it's been years ago now. That's a long time. <laughs> um, but I was invited to go on a trip to Japan 10 years ago um, to see the Yamaha factories and just kind of meet a lot of the people um, there in Japan that are involved with the company. And I was so amazed and impressed um, with the workmanship and the commitment to excellence that these artists really um, that are making these pianos have. And so it was really that trip, I would say, that um, motivated me to kind of further that connection and so Bonnie Barrett, who is the head of Yamaha Artist Services in New York, and I had a conversation and she asked me if I would be interested in becoming a Yamaha artist. And I honestly didn't really know what that meant. Um, and so she kind of explained it to me. It's, it's not really that I'm exclusively only allowed to play Yamaha pianos, <laughs> although I love Yamaha pianos, um, a great Yamaha CFX for me can be just as good as a beautiful Steinway or a, a handmade Kawaii. Um, so it's, it's not, it's not that, you know, you can only play Yamaha pianos, but basically Yamaha agrees to support you and your performing career and your festivals and things like that when, and, sh you know, should you need them and when you need them. So they've been amazing over the years. Um, they help out sponsoring the Hihon festival and providing pianos for the students there. Um, they also helped me a lot in my first uh, CD recording, um, which was recorded as a combination with the Yamaha disc clavier and traditional recording techniques. And so they provided the pianos for that and the technicians for that. And then also for the, um, the CD launch recital, they also provided the piano and the technicians for that. So they've just been, you know, other, other series and festivals um, here and there they've helped out with. And it's just been an amazing reference. And I love the fact that not only are they committed to excellence in their own pianos, but they're not possessive. So if I play a concert on a Steinway, they're not going to <laughs> be frustrated by that. 
Um, instead, they they believe in that competition and they believe in you know aiming for excellence at the the highest level in whatever instrument you're choosing to play. That sounds great. And um, you mentioned that your recording was uh, with uh, Yamaha label. And what was the process of the recording like? Was that your first album, the WC album? Yes, yes. Um, so it was a very interesting process. And just to clarify, it's not on the Yamaha label, but it okay. was um, sponsored by Yamaha in the sense that they provided the pianos and the technician. Um, but the process was very interesting because what I did was I actually recorded it twice. Uh, so the first time I recorded the album was on the disc clavier in the Yamaha Artist Studio in New York City. And um, I played it and it was recorded on the disc clavier and then it was recorded as a playback by the disc clavier itself. So it was very surreal to watch and hear myself playing from 10 feet away. <laughs> as it was being recorded. Um, and then I also recorded it a, a few days later in the Academy of Arts and Letters in New York City uh, with the same piano, but not the disc clavier um, version. So just the regular uh, piano and recorded it in a traditional way with the producer and a tech, um, an audio engineer and a technician and everything. And so the final product is a result um, of a little bit of a mixture between the two. And it's just a very interesting, I think, acoustic experiment um, because the two process, two processes were so very different. And I, I can't really say that I liked one more than the other. The disc clavier process was fascinating and it's amazing what you can do with that recording technology. Um, but of course, recording in the Academy of Arts and Letters in the traditional way was also thrilling. Yes. A lot of yonder artists these days, uh, they are looking to record their first album and then produce their first CD. Do you have, do you have any advice for people who are uh, trying to do a project like that? My advice for all kinds of projects, not just recording projects, um, is it's kind of simple but and direct, but it's what has kind of gotten me through life. It's just do it. Before you, <laughs> Nike, right? Um, no, but before you know how to do it, you, of course, you can talk to mentors and you can talk to other people who've gone through the process, but don't be intimidated by all the things that you don't know, or don't be intimidated by all the steps that you see, foresee in this process. Instead, just start. And, you know, such simple advice, start by starting or just go for it, those kinds of things, it actually really does apply because how do we know how to do anything in life, right? I had I had never applied for a loan before I bought my first house. I had never changed a diaper before I had my first kid, right? I never made a CD before I made my first recording. You just, you do it and you figure it out as you go. And then if you do it again, it's a whole lot easier. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You started a concert series like that, right? Uh, when you just moved to um, well, where you live right now and you started a concert series. Can you tell me a little bit about that process? Yeah, so I, I think I have a problem, which is that whenever <laughs> I see a space or a beautiful piano in a, in a beautiful space, I imagine what could be. So just like when I hear a student play, I hear the potential. Um, when I hear a beautiful piano, I also suddenly am, am imagining concert series and festivals everywhere I look. Um, so what happened was there's this very fascinating place um, called the Bullsburg Mansion and Museum, very near to where I live. And it's kind of a hidden gem, I would say, of this area. No one would ever know that it exists um, because even though it's named mansion, it's really just a large house because, you know, big houses in the 1800s are totally different from what a big house is today, at least in this area. So um, the, the museum is a fascinating place though. It has artifacts from all of history, like including Egyptian artifacts, all kinds of instruments. Um, they have a house piano and they have this gorgeous ballroom. It's small, but it's beautiful wooden floors, um, bookshelves, amazing antique furniture. And so when I first visited the museum for a different reason, just to kind of do some local tourism, I was amazed by this space and the acoustics in the space. And so of course, immediately I talked to the museum director, I got in touch with him and I said, 
what do you think about starting a concert series here? Maybe just like three concerts a year. Would that be something that you guys would be interested in? And he is an amazing person. His passion for the museum is infectious. And he jumped on the idea. He was like, oh, that's just the kind of thing we're looking for. We would love to do that. And he said, would you be willing to organize it? And I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so it was kind of like a match made in heaven um, because we were both really passionate about what we do. So um, we organized one one season and that was a very successful season. And then with three concerts, we had Alexander Cobran play and a Spanish pianist, Francisco Montero. And then I played the third recital. And then of course the next year was COVID. So we haven't been able to uh, continue that although plans are in the works and we're hoping for this spring. Um, but again, the space is very small. It's hard to social distance in the space. So we're not sure what what the future, the near future will bring. But the plans are to, to, of course, bring it back after COVID. Yeah, that's wonderful. Let's hope that we will be able to attend in-person concert very soon. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> so I met you, I think, three years ago uh, or four years ago in Spain at the Gijon F International Piano Festival. And then that was a great experience. I loved just being in Spain and uh, I had lessons with a lot of great faculties. And um, it's, very, it's very sad that because of the pandemic, we had to miss two editions of the festival. I was wondering if you have anything to say to um, the applicants, students, or um, people who are interested in coming to the recitals about the next edition, 2022 He Home Festival. Yeah, I think um, I, would, I would encourage everyone to apply. I'm very hopeful that the pandemic will be under control by the summer of 2022, um, at least to the point where we can travel um, safely. And I think 2022 is going to be a very special edition because we will be honoring Dominique Weber, who sadly left us last year. Um, and he was a longtime faculty member from Geneva and very well loved by all the students. And I had the honor and privilege of playing for him at the Hihon Festival when I was a student. So we'll be planning a concert, memorial concert for him, um, at least that one event um, and maybe more. And I'm hoping that some of his former students will be coming to perform and just honor his life and celebrate his life. And I think the energy that we're going to have at that festival after missing two years is going to be extremely high. Uh, we'll, we're going to have wonderful pianists and performers as always. But that again, you know, that's that same feeling that I had at Palmetto of the energy of being in the room that I had always taken for granted, you know, pre-COVID. Um, I think that's going to be palpable in summer of 2022. So everyone should come. <laughs> yes, definitely. And um, you see a lot of young artists, young pianists. Uh, or people who recently just graduated who uh, go to Hihon Festival and they're trying to make it in the profession and they're working very hard to do everything they can to try to be um, to try to be uh, viable and have a career in piano and I was wondering if you have any advice for uh, young professionals well I think my my best advice even though this may may not be very helpful um, in the immediate, but my best advice is to focus on the process rather than focusing on the results. Uh, because if you are trying to, let's say, you know, be famous, that's a very intangible kind of result. And, or if you're trying to, to get even just something more tangible, like if you're just trying to get a job, we all need to get jobs. I understand that, but the jobs will come the opportunities will come if you are consistent in your daily process. So if you enjoy that process of, you know, practicing and trying to become the best that you can be, learning everything you can from mentors, jumping at every chance that is offered to you, even if it seems small, um, or even if it seems, you know, quote unquote, beneath you at the time, uh, consider it and, and think about the people that you might meet or the, the things that you might learn from that opportunity. And, and enjoy that, that daily process, because I think that that is going to lead you somewhere much more than getting frustrated every time you don't get that job or that concert. Um, and I think that long-term 
happiness and contentment with the profession and the process is so much more important than that momentary, did I get this job from this interview? Even though that seems like the most important thing at the time, it's actually not. What's more important is the long-term um, trajectory of being a pianist and, and being filled with music every day. Great. Did you have um, any certain um, mentors that guided you throughout your um, career? I definitely would say so. I, of course, was very fortunate uh, in my high school years to meet Miyoko Lotto. Um, and she inspired me because she was that, I met her when I was around 16 years old. And so she was kind of that musical mom figure, mentor that I had been missing in my life. And she helped me prepare my college audition. And to be 100% honest, if it hadn't been from her, for her, I don't think I would have been able to get into Manhattan School of Music because I just had so many gaps in my training. And she was able to pull you know, everything together in a very short amount of time to help me get ready for a, a major in piano performance. So I owe her a lot, but it's not just the, what she taught me about piano playing, but what she taught me about caring for students um, that I really that really sticks with me. She went above and beyond. She drove her students to competitions. She helped them fill out applications. If they couldn't afford the application fee, she would pay for it. She taught certain students for free if they couldn't afford lessons for a certain time period. Um, so she was just really, really inspiring that way. And then after that, I, of course, studied with a lot of amazing teachers, but Julian Martin, of course, stands out as one of my most vibrant musical mentors, and specifically for piano, I feel like he taught me so much. Uh, he taught me a lot about how to look and listen to my own playing and ask questions. Why are you doing that? What purpose does that serve? And for some students, he's a little bit direct, <laughs> but that's what I needed at that time. I needed someone to just treat me with that very practical, um, kind of attitude and it really helped kind of snap me into <laughs> snap me into shape and think oh my goodness you know I need to connect my body with my brain with my ears because they were all kind of disconnected still when I met him even though I already had my doctorate at that point <laughs> uh, there was just a lot of musical connection and growth and reflection that I needed to to do so I would say that he was a very strong influence in my life and I have to say my first husband, Jose Ramon Mendez, uh, would probably be very, very close up there uh, with those other two, because even though he was never my teacher, um, I just learned so much from him, just being married to him and being around him. And I still admire and respect him so much. And he's probably my favorite living pianist <laughs> to this day. Um, so I have to include him uh, in there for sure as one of my big big influences yeah that's wonderful i've met all of them and then they're all great people great musician great pianists yeah. great thank you so much for talking with me it's always been very inspirational to talk with you talk with you about your career and music making and also see you teach and then see your work your magic at the festivals <laughs> And I hope that we'll be able to see each other uh, very soon in person. And then I hope all hope you all the best with your coming year. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for having me on this interview. Yes, great. Thank you.